And in what war did you serve? The Korean War or Cold War, whichever uh, it might be, I don't know because they never really explain that. <laughs> and uh, what branch of service? U.S. Air Force. And what was your highest rank while serving? Airman First Class. And what were the general locations that you served? Texas, Newfoundland, and Headquarters USAF in Washington, D.C. And uh, did you, were you drafted or did you enlist? I enlisted. And where were you living at the time? In Connecticut. Do you recall the date that you joined? Uh, December 15th, uh, 1950. And why did you join? I had two friends. One was at Colgate and the other was at State Teachers College in New Haven. We were very close. They both joined the Air Force and some things that were happening at school with me, I decided that uh, that was what I was going to do and so we all did. And why did you pick the Air Force? I liked it. Uh, I came from a family of Marines. My father was in the Army for five years, and uh, I decided I liked the Air Force, and I went to the Air Force. Talk about uh, your first days in the service. What were they like? My first day in the service was New Year's Day, 1951. I got off the train, and of course, the drill sergeants were there to gather us and put us on buses. And I, of course, had to be the first one to have an incident. In the seat of the bus where I was going to sit, there was a spring sticking up through the cushion. So I decided to move, and the sergeant screamed at me and asked me why I was going, to, why I was moving. And I said, well, there's a spring sticking up in the seat. He said, that's your seat? Sit there. We went to the air base, Lackland Air Force Base, and went through processing, uh, were issued, all the, the only uniforms they had Parts of the uniform that they had were a fatigue cap and a field jacket. And of course, the process took until 2 o'clock in the morning before we even got a chance to eat. And then taken off to a barracks and of course went to bed. We were awakened at 5 in the morning. Uh, do you remember any of your instructors there? No, I don't. Wait a minute, there was one... Um, good Lord, I can't remember his name. No, I really don't. And after, what, what was boot camp like for you? I was in very good physical shape, but others were not that, um, in that good a shape. And I went through it fairly easy because a lot of it was running and PT and all of that. And it didn't bother me that much. They were very strict. Uh, of course, that comes with basic training. And uh, the we did all sorts of things. Uh, the things that stick out in my mind is when you went to the mess hall, or my first day at the mess hall, they were having pork chops for lunch, and I decided, he says, how many? And I said, two, they looked good. And so sat down to eat with the mashed potatoes and whatever, and the pork chops were terrible. <laughs> so I decided, I'm not going to eat them. <laughs> get to the trash can, and there's the mess sergeant standing by the trash can. He says, why didn't you eat the pork chops? I said, well, they didn't taste too good. Did you take them? Yes, I did. 
Well, the rule here is if you take it, you eat it. And now let's see you eat it. And had to stand there and eat the pork chips. Lackland at that time was having a very hard time because they enlisted so many people. They didn't have billeting for them. There were people sleeping out at night in the fields and in January, it does get cold in Texas. Uh, all sorts of things were going on. All of a sudden there was a big congressional investigation and there were tents going up, stoves going in. Um, it just, they turned the whole place upside down and uh, the, the commander was relieved. It was a huge scandal. And I never got, I marched in my civilian shoes and that field jacket and field hat for, I would say, three to four weeks before we even got clothing because they were out of it. And that was at the time they issued the new Air Force blue uniform. That was about it, I'd say, in the basic portion. Uh, after boot camp, where did you go? I stayed at Lackland as an air policeman. Um, they, you take tests there uh, to see where you should be placed and all of that, but I don't think they paid much attention to the test because whatever they needed that day, that's where you went. And I ended up as an air policeman there. My job as an air policeman there was gate security and that sort of thing. But later on, I was uh, put on train detail where I would take the train from San Antonio, Texas to St. Louis, Missouri to escort uh, recruits back to Texas and make sure that they were safe while they were on the train. Um, that was about it, uh, other than the regular run-of-the-mill things that we did, uh, like honor guards. I have a picture of uh, King Saud. We were an honor guard for him. I have a paper clipping there that you could look at. Uh, MacArthur, when he left, uh, the military came to San Antonio. We lined the streets with the military. And um, I had an opportunity to guard Bob Hope and Carolina uh, Cotton. That was my assignment. Was I had to take care of her. And a lot of good things happened. Uh, San Antonio was a great city to be stationed there. I saw the, uh, they call it the White Elephant of the Air Force. It was KC-99. It was the biggest air tra transport airplane ever made. Uh, it was supposed to be, to be like the uh, B-36, which was a huge bomber with uh, six pusher, uh, prop uh, engines and uh, four jet engines under the wing. Uh, that was at uh, Kelly Air Force Base, which was down the hill. Another thing that happened in Korea, they ran out of 50-gallon drums, and they manufactured probably a million of them because they sent them all to Kelly. The, the, it was a place where they were going to ship them out of to Korea. And there must have been two miles of 50-gallon drums about a, two football fields wide and God knows how high uh, at Kelly Air Force Bay. That, that always stuck with me. The other thing at Kelly, there were a lot of airplanes that were there in mothballs from uh, World War II with all the uh, bombing missions and the fighters that they had shot down. They were in... It was like driving through uh, history. I had an occasion while I was at uh, Lachlan, I was assigned to General Vandenberg, who was a very, very famous uh, general. Um, 
to guard his plane and I was handed a list of who was allowed to come to his plane, uh, which I had saved and believe it or not, I can't find that anymore. Um, San Antonio was a good, good year. Yeah. And then, uh, after, how long were you in the military police at? Always. Okay. Yeah. It was called Air Force Security, which covered everything. Our job was police, but our main job was as infantry, light infantry protect the air base. In Newfoundland, we had no army, uh, no one else to protect us. We had to do our thing. And if you look through some of the pictures, for the, I was an armorer for a while up there. Uh, we had all sorts of mortars and 50 caliber machine guns, which is something you don't normally find in Air Force, but we had to defend ourselves. So after Texas, you went to Newfoundland? Yes. I was in Texas for a year. And then I was shipped out of New Texas in February and went on to Newfoundland. I was from, I went to Camp Kilmer and was shipped out of there by Liberty ship to Newfoundland. And I was so lucky to run into the biggest storm in 10 years in the North Atlantic and was written up in National Geographic. <laughs> and we took a pounding for two nights in two days and finally got there on the third day. And uh, in fact, in my pictures there, I have a picture of the Liberty ship that took us up there. Um, it just it was a horror scene, uh, seasick. It was just a mess. And someone said to one morning, uh, they spotted land. <laughs> I dug through a whole pile of duffel bags <laughs> until I found mine. <laughs> and I would, we were in the bottom, we were into the hole of the ship. And I dragged it all the way upstairs at seven o'clock in the morning. It was freezing cold. And I'm standing by the rail with my duffel bag. And one of the merchant seamen came by. He said, you're going to be here a long time before we dock. I said, well, I'm never going to go back down there. I'm going to stand right here. <laughs> so uh, what were your responsibilities in Newfoundland? In Newfoundland, we landed in St. John's, and uh, when you enter the harbor in St. John's, there are cliffs on both sides. And it's a big thing when uh, a Liberty ship came in there. Uh, the people would come out in rowboats and uh, with their kids, and it was, you know, like something for them to see. And we went in and docked as you went straight in. But they, they docked right on the right. If you look to the left in that harbor, there was a ship that had been sunk by a German subs and was left there, still standing there all rusty. And then we went up to an air base called Pepperell uh, Air Force Base, which was headquarters, the headquarters for the Northeast Air Command. Um, and... They, we loaded on trucks, went up to the air base. We, they have, like, they call them motels. Or, and uh, we got off there, and I started going up the stairs, and the stairs flattened out after being on <laughs> shift, <laughs> seasick for quite a few days. Um, I just barely made it upstairs that I got in a shower and stood there for an hour and then went to bed and by morning I got up I felt like a different person. Uh, and we were, some of us were sent down to the harbor to clean up the ship that had left already, it went on to Germany. And uh, 
We had to wait to go on to Harmon Air Force Base, which was on the other side of the island. Uh, one night they said, okay, you're gonna, we're going to go by train. In Newfoundland, you get the Grand Banks have fog like you wouldn't believe. It had come in there, it was days. And while we were there, they put us on duty. And we went to clean out an old base called Tora Bay, an old fighter base where the Air Force had fighters out there where they could uh, hold off the German uh, uh, subs, which would be bold enough to come right in some of those little coves and take time off. The, get out of the subs for a while, and they would, of course, try and find them. Uh, we cleaned that up while we were there. I was in a hospital, an old hospital that they had left. And there were all the, the uh, notes were pinned on the walls of uh, uh, different squadrons and where they had to fly out to and all that. It was, it was Pretty interesting. It felt like it went back in history. And then they shipped us out by train. And in Newfoundland, the trains were narrow gauge track. And of course, with all the snow they get, I guess they have two or three engines pulling them. And we were traveling during the night. And I'm looking out the window and I said to myself, geez, does this fog ever go away? Finally, it was light enough. I'm looking out the window and I'm seeing these round things sticking out of the snow. And shortly after, I see a cross member of a pole sticking out of the snow. It wasn't fog, it was snow I was seeing on either side of that train. And we got to a place called the Gap Topsail. It's the highest, one of the highest points, I guess, in Newfoundland. And it looked like someone had taken all the snow out around the building and dug a huge bowl. But what that is, it's so windy, it blew around the building and left this station wide open. And... Uh, then we went on from there to Stephenville, and we get into Stephenville, and I look in the railroad station, and I, it's dark, and there are a few people in there. There's a wood-burning stove, and everybody's around it. Nobody's there to pick us up. Lo and behold, here comes some GI, two GI trucks to pick us up. We had to go to from Stephenville crossing to Stephenville, which was over a mountain, a not too big a mountain. And we're about halfway up this mountain and they stop and the next thing I hear is clanging, clacking like uh, tanks or bulldozers and they're coming to pull us to get us over the hill and back down on the other side where Stephenville was, and we got to Stephenville uh, that night. Um, Newfoundland was a lot of training, a lot of things to keep you busy, because the monotony, it was a very isolated uh, place. It, uh, left you feeling like, you know, how long can I stay here? How long can I take this? And the proof of that, they would send probably a whole plain load a month out of there with men that could not take that kind of uh, pressure. I fortunately got involved making tables and chairs and selling them to guys that wanted them for their, their like a night table or whatever, and uh, did a lot of things to stay busy, and uh, that helped. Um, 
we, the base was being enlarged. They never really told us, you know, what was going on. Uh, if you saw a picture of the air base, you would not see the portion where they were building huge hangars. And uh, no one paid attention, no one asked any questions. Uh, we had a whole lot of new equipment delivered, delivered fire engines, jeeps, trucks, fuel trucks, you name it, we were getting it. But they were assigned to SAC. We weren't allowed to use them. They would run them once a month, make sure that they were all working. Um, we would get sack movements like the uh, B-29s and the B-50s coming through to Europe. They would spend the night and then go on to Europe. We would get a lot of civilian aircraft there that couldn't get into Gander because Gander was fogged in a lot. We weren't that bad off and so they would send them in to us in fact that base is now used that way it's a, a safe place to if you're in trouble you can get into uh, the weather is fairly decent by comparison to other parts of the island and um, the regular duties of guard and uh, whatever they assigned you to. Fortunately, I got to be an armor, which we, I was allowed to, we took care of all the weapons and that sort of thing. It kind of took you out of the weather because the weather could, as we used to say, it's either snowing or it's blowing. And that's the way it was. The base went on to be built as one of the largest in the Northeast. It became the biggest base in the Northeast Air Command. And that command covered um, Labrador, which is now called Labrador, Newfoundland, or Newfoundland, Labrador. Uh, it went as far as Denmark. It went as far north as uh, Fletcher's Island, which was a floating island, uh, ice island. Thule, which was in Greenland. Um, it went all the way to Norway. And then the Navy went from Argentia, which was that road that joined the two air bases, to down the barrier reef south to patrol uh, the, the coast of the United States. And of course, the other was to protect north with that, while I was there, they built three radar lines that were called, uh, we were in Pine Tree. I think the north, furthest north was Dew Line and the one south of us is Red Line. And they covered the whole uh, north for anything coming over from Russia because Fletcher's Island was so close to Russia that sometimes it would float into the Russian waters and uh, they would, uh, of course, we'd have to get off. <laughs> and then, of course, when it came back, we'd get back on again. Um, and, of course, Thule had a, uh, a big transmitter that could transmit all over the world from that site. And... Other than that, uh, not a heck of a lot more. I used to go into Sydney to pick up A walls and that sort of thing, which was south of us. You'd have to cross the, go by boat to get there, or a plane if they had one available going in there. And, of course, I got my security clearance there, and I always feel that the reason I was sent to headquarters USAF is because I had that clearance, and it took time to get it, and then, of course, they had to go through the steps to go higher and higher and higher. And when I went to Bowling Air Force Base, I was assigned to a place called Temple U, 
which was right downtown in D.C. The FBI was in one side, the, the uh, Justice Department was across the street, and the White House was the next corner, and behind me was the Smithsonian Institute and, uh, and uh, Washington Monument. So it was a wonderful place to be. I was promoted to Airman First there and stayed there for a year. And of course, I was discharged from there and came home. Um, it was a very busy time in D.C. I spent a lot of time in the city. Uh, Eisenhower was president. And had the opportunity to uh, see a lot of things there. What were your uh, duties in Washington, D.C.? In Washington, D.C., I started off at the main gate, and then I was transferred to a building called Temple U at 12th and Constitution. That building covered many things. Uh, a lot of them I didn't know about. It's the first time I've ever seen, I don't know if you ever remember the IBM cards. They were building one of those in there, and I was amazed to see the amount of wires and things that went in it. In that building was headquarters for Jan Joint Task Force 7, which was um, the... the uh, the, the task force that was te going to be testing the hydrogen bomb. And on their wall in their office, they had a plaster of Paris map of Anahuitac, where they were going to do it. And I was there at the time that it did go off, not at the site, but at that building. That was one of them. Then there was another section where they would get aerial photographs from all over the world. And they had people that would know. Uh, and these photographs, from what I understand, were, you could pick out a house and know exactly whose house it was. And they had people that could identify, working for them, could identify all these things in these cities like in Russia or China or wherever they went. And the planes would leave our, they were next to our air base called Anacostia. They were black death tombs and they'd take off and leave and come back some time later. No one knew where they went. And of course, I'm sure that all those aerial photographs wound up at Temple U. Uh, security was tight. There were some areas where I didn't have a clearance to go in them and work. If I had to, for some particular reason, if they had to open a safe after hours or whatever, I could escort them to the area, but I was not allowed in it. It was pretty secure. Couldn't get in there too easily. Um, then, of course, I was discharged from D.C. They wanted me to stay, but I was in a family business and decided I would leave. I was offered a job there by the district police and just decided I had enough. I was going home. So what was a typical day like in D.C.? D.C.? Depending on what shift you were on, if it was in the morning, it got up real early, went to breakfast, and then they took you into the city. If I was stayed, when I was stationed there and in the city, or otherwise I'd report to my gate or wherever I was assigned on the base. At Boeing Air Force Base, you had 13 generals, and it was spit and polish. Uh, you made sure you were dressed properly and everything was proper. Um, 
I had an incident one night. I was asked to go down and they had a plane coming in with General LeMay on it. And they had to put a guard on it and they didn't have enough people. And they asked me if I'd do it. It was like if I went out of my barracks, which was gorgeous. It was a World War I barracks, all made out of brick with huge porches on it. And I walked down there and the plane came in and walked over to the plane and the pilot came out and handed me a list of who was allowed on the plane and off the plane. And here comes General LeMay with his cigar in his mouth and walks over to me and said, Airman, do you know what your orders are? I said, sir, yes, sir, I do. The one thing is no smoking on the flight line. <laughs> he grinned and walked away. <laughs> and I later was reading that no one would ever dare tell him about the cigar. Oh, I felt like saying I ought to send him a letter and tell him <laughs> what I told him. <laughs> and I... Had to spend a few hours uh, under the plane, but then I went back to the barracks. And, um, we used to have congressmen and senators come to our mess hall. And the food was great. Uh, not like Newfoundland. They had different types of bread and whatever you wanted. Uh, were you awarded any medals or citations? My two medals were the American Defense and the Good Conduct Medal. And when did you receive those? I received them. The Good Conduct was in D.C. And the American Defense, I don't remember when that was issued. But it's on my discharge. I mean, my uh, service record, my 214. And how did you come about getting those? They are, uh, I don't, they are, it's not like a bronze star or anything like that. It's just a, uh, you, you behave yourself for a certain, it takes two or three years to get the good conduct medal. In the American defense, everyone gets it. It, that served in certain periods, I guess. They're not, uh, what you would call, uh, you know, combat medals. That's that's another thing. Get purple Heart and that sort of thing. That's another class altogether. Did you stay in touch with your family while you were in the service? Did I what? Did you stay in touch with your family while you were in the service? Well, it got pretty bad when I got to D.C. that my mother went to the Red Cross and they called the chaplain and the chaplain called me and I had to go and explain to him why I wasn't communicating with my parents. Uh, that that uh, you got so you were so busy it wasn't like Newfoundland where you had plenty of time or Texas you were just in and you wanted to keep connected to the family when you got to a place you really enjoyed you just didn't have enough time to sit down and write letters uh, whenever you were free you were I was in downtown in the museums or uh, going into the capital or doing things that most people would like to do can't do it because uh, they never get the opportunity to go there it was just unbelievable I enjoyed the city so much that when my children were old enough for at least 11 years, we would go every February vacation, school vacation to Washington, and they, they never, ever forgot all that. Did you ever feel pressure or stress? The, in Newfoundland... Well, when you first get in, it's kind of hard to get over it. You're young. You don't know what's going to happen. Um, and it's all new. And, of course, the sergeants don't 
the drill sergeants don't make it feel real comfortable. And that's, there's a reason for that. I think they do a good job of, you know, getting you to work and click and do what you're supposed to do when you're told to do it. And you can't be nice when you have to accomplish that mission. Um, then, of course, when I went to Newfoundland, that was the feeling that you were isolated. Let's say if I wanted to call home, I'd have to call to a certain point, and by radio, they would go to the mainland and then on to, you know, your home or whatever, which I only did once or twice for some special occasion. But the the feeling of uh, isolation it was it was pretty bad. Uh, a lot of men couldn't really take that kind of pressure. You wrote home a lot to try and stay connected, and uh, you'll see on one of those orders I got the days how many days left written up in the corner, which was. You weren't supposed to do that. But that's what you did. You just, unless you wanted to drink all the time, but uh, I never drank in my life until I got there. Or smoked. But there was nothing to do. So how did you uh, handle or deal with the stress? Kept busy did things, went to the wood shop, made things. Uh, took a lot of pictures. Didn't like the camera, sold it to someone else and bought a new one. <laughs> went to church a lot. Did you have anything that you did for good luck when you were out doing your activities? Good luck? You mean like something that I would carry? Yeah. No, not really. Never did. Never felt that way. How did people entertain themselves? How did they entertain themselves? Spent a lot of time at the Airmen's Club. And there was an occasion we didn't have one for the enlisted. We had it for the non-coms and the officers. General Vandenberg came through and said, these men need their own club. He was going to Europe and said, when I come back through here, I want to see some action. And they did build an airman's club. And I must say, they did some fierce drinking. <laughs> and that's... You went there when you had spare time, if that's what you wanted to do. Yeah. So when you were in Texas and you were an MP, did you meet any other entertainers? Uh, Texas, you went to San Antonio. There was a lot to do. You had the river walk. Uh, you had parks. I went to different parks, the zoo. Uh, it was like any big city. Nice restaurants, uh, hotels on the boardwalk. Uh, it was it was great. Uh, they had a fiesta that they used to celebrate. I was uh, had to work in that. I worked with some Texas sheriffs when we were assigned to the Riverwalk, and um, it was it was good. Did you ever go on leave while you were in Newfoundland? Yes. What did you do on, on leave and where did you go? Well, I went to, well, I got two three-day passes and one prisoner I had to pick up in Sydney, Nova Scotia. I took breaks and went there. Met a gentleman there who was from Waterbury, Connecticut. He was a teacher. We became very friendly and it was right off. And he said, whenever you come here, you come to my house and I'll let you take my car, which I did the second time I went there. I took leave two or three times. 
one of them was on, uh, I went to my CEO and said, sir, I got to get out of here for a few days. And he said, if you can make all the arrangements, you can get out of here. Well, I made it in two days and got on a plane and they've got a picture of an airplane there, a fighter that went through the GCA shack and we were ready to take off on Thanksgiving morning. He hit the GCA shack and we were, we were pre-flighting to take off and I got into uh, Westover at two o'clock in the afternoon and I found the cabbie and he, I said, could you drive me to Hamden, Connecticut? And he said, yeah, I could do that. I said, how much you want? He says, $20. I says, well, all I got is 12. <laughs> he says, I'll take you home. <laughs> and I got there, oh, maybe four or five o'clock in the afternoon. So, uh, what was it like serving in D.C. during the Cold War? It was great. Uh, it was the best, one of the best things that ever happened to me in my life. I had an opportunity to spend time in museums that most people would love to see. At a time when you could walk up to a painting and no one was watching you, uh, you could go in any museum and you were alone. Uh, later, when I used to go there with my children, there was always someone watching or because, I guess, of problems that they had. And it just like, okay, I don't have to go on duty until 3, so at 8 o'clock I'd run into the city. Well, I had a brand new Mercury that my dad bought for me before I left to go to D.C., and I could get around very easy. And I was uh, on uh, Capitol Street, which was right across from the National Airport. In 20 minutes, I could be at the, the Capitol in D.C. And being in the service, I had the opportunity, when we went and got there, they sent us an orientation. And they took us through the Capitol and through the White House and places where most people couldn't go. And it was just it was a wonderful place for to learn. And I was at the age where I, as much as I could absorb, I'm going to do it. The Jefferson Memorial, the Lincoln Memorial, I mean, they, and I didn't do them once, I did them many times. Uh, it just was great. Do you have any other humorous or interesting events while you were in any of your locations? Well, in Newfoundland, we had a seven-day alert in the month of February. My job was, I was assigned to the um, bomb supply dump. And um, being that I was the air policeman there, I was in charge of it. And I wind up with the one of the head sergeants from headquarters in the group that was working with me to protect this site. We had our Arctic gear on. Not only did it snow, it rained and everything else. And he was always complaining about how cold it was. And, you know, just couldn't make him happy. Well, if I were him, I wouldn't be too happy either. Because <laughs> I wasn't jumping with joy. And the rules were, you don't dig in to get in the snow to stay warm, especially at night, because if you, we were getting about a foot of snow a day. And you just have to live with the conditions. And it gets to a point where the Arctic gear doesn't work after a while. You get very tired from the temperature. 
and he's constantly complaining and turned me in and did all sorts of things and um, and uh, we were relieved but they couldn't get to us because of the depth of the snow we were only across the runway but they had to dig it, dig through to pick us up and get us out of there. And we couldn't walk through it. It was too deep. So they come in to get us. I go back to the barracks. And we weren't supposed to have liquor in the barracks. But we always had it hidden someplace. <laughs> so Tom Dillon, my roommate, we had the new barracks. We had rooms with four men in them. You had your cupboard in the whole bit. We started drinking and got feeling pretty good. Went and took a shower. I hadn't shaved in a week, ripped my face apart. Went to the, the what they, we used to call it the Degink Hotel. Who's there but Walter Pigeon? checking in because he was going to Thule for a show for the people up there. He said that he thought it was a lovely place. And I said, well, I look like I got hit by a truck. I said, well, you ought to be stationed here for a while. Um, there were a lot of things that you wouldn't normally do, but uh, it was a good life. Never had to see combat. That was worth a lot of it. And I believe it was as good as uh, a couple of years at UConn, as far as what you learned. What did you think of uh, officers and fellow servicemen? I never, I got along with them. I had no problems. You know, anyone that uh, was a little grouchy, I just stay away from them. That's all. Never had problems. Never had problems with officers. My Provo Marshal treated me as part of his family. He used to have me at his house for holidays up there. It, just like part of the family. I was fortunate. I got along with people and didn't get into the mix of the problems. I was fairly good at art. I made a big four by eight sign with Santa Claus riding on the tail of a um, F-94, I guess it was. Put it on the main gate and decorated the whole thing and did things uh, to make people happy. Uh, I designed a squadron patch, which was accepted uh, by everyone. Um, while I was in charge, when I, when I was sent to the main gate, I was put in charge of all civilian personnel entering and leaving the base, which became quite a amount because Trans-Canadian Airline would uh, land a plane every day there to go into Canada, into Quebec or wherever. And uh, I had to check, clear all those people in and out. And while I was at the main gate, they were, they had formed a brand new band that was, I'll never forget this gentleman, Warrant Officer Ship. And one of the guys in the band that wrote the music was from Hamden and went to school with me, Siebert Johnson. He convinces sworn officer ship because whenever they needed anything, he didn't know how to get supplies. He didn't know how to do this or do that. I knew the whole base. I knew the whole system. Uh, he said, I would like to have you as uh, the first sergeant of the band. I said, no, I said, that's not my bag. I'm not good at that. He says, I said, I don't play an instrument. He said, I'll teach you how to play the bass drum. I said, no, thanks. I said, I'll, I'll do it for you. I'll do whatever you want me to do. I'll help you out. But I don't want to be in the band. Lo and behold, I get a call 
the major went to see me. They sent a carrier all down to pick me up, brought me back up to his office, and he screaming at me, why did I go to the base commander to become the first sergeant of the band? I said, sir, I did not do that. <laughs> and I told him what happened. Uh, fortunately, uh, I didn't get canned by him. <laughs> So where were you when your service ended? My service ended in Washington, D.C. at Bowling Air Force Base. And what was that day like for you? It was good and it was bad. I had a lot of people to say goodbye to. I was fortunate I had an uncle in D.C. and I had a cousin who was in the Air Force there who flew the D.C. 3 and occasionally I would ride in a plane with him somewhere, and it became like a second home. I was moved into new barracks that were uh, like uh, motels, and it always stuck in my head. When I first joined the Air Force, they gave me some literature with the, the, the airmen dancing with these gorgeous women around a swimming pool. <laughs> and finally, at the, the new uh, new barracks that they gave me, there was a swimming pool there. I said, they finally showed up with the pool. <laughs> and uh, it, it, it almost was like I stayed there just as long as I could because I was driving home. So I wouldn't drive too much in the dark going home. What was your homecoming like? Got home about two in the morning. It was snowing. Uh, well, we had a business where we plowed snow for factories and things like that. It was good. Everybody was up. Went to bed at five o'clock in the morning. Here comes my father up the stairs. Okay, it's time to go to the work. Go to work. <laughs> I said, no, nah, this isn't for real. <laughs> he says, I know you're not sleeping. I said, will you please leave me alone? You know, I would never say that to him before I left. <laughs> but I had to go to work. So nothing changed. Uh, so aside from going back to work, did you also go to school? What's that? Did you also go to school aside from going back to work? No, I never did go back. We bought out another company in Waterbury. Uh, we became a very large landscape contractor. We had 50 acres of nursery. I did Interstate 91. I did uh, two airfields. I did 18 to 20 parks in the state. I just We just grew into a very big company, and that took up all my time. Did you make any close friendships while you were in the service? I did. In fact, there's a picture there of me, the girl that this gentleman married. I was in his wedding party. Uh, uh, there was a family in Waterbury. They were there. I had met them in Texas. Um, but you, when you leave, you leave. You just don't go back for some reason. It's the same thing when I left the foot guard. I told him I will never come back because I've been in charge too long. And I don't want people coming to me saying that he's not doing the job right. And what would you do or what would you say? I didn't want that. I just ended it and walked away. Did you continue any of those relationships after you left the service, aside from, from the letter? No. The one that I was closest to was a gentleman by the name of George Baker. Lived in uh, Missoula, Montana. And we just disconnected. Um, here about a year ago, I, my daughter got on Facebook and see if we could find them. 
but we couldn't find him. I often said that I would like to go back and find him, but I'm sure he's gone by now. I'm 84 and George is probably a few years older than I was. Did uh, your military experience influence your thinking about war or the military in general? I, I love the military or I would have never been in the foot guard as many years as I stayed there. Not only did I stay in the foot guard for over 20 years, I took on a task of being the president of the 102nd Museum in West Haven. And I was there for 20 years as president until we finally built it and finished it. I say that if you take the oath to join, when you join and, and agree to it and sign the papers, then do your job. It's great. It's good life if you don't have to go into combat. But then there's the other side of the coin. There's some people who love that. And I get very upset when I read, like Snowden, get, giving away top secret information and the other young fellow with uh, WikiLeaks, you, you took that oath and to get a security clearance, you really don't have any right to give that information away and that upsets me very much. I love the military and the men, it's a feeling where, I don't know, you're like, it's a fraternity. You understand each other. Not that I'm excluding everybody else because not everybody wants to do that. And not everybody can do it because they're kind of picky on who they take to. You know, they don't want a handicapped person or whatever. So you can't blame them for the way they think or what they want to do. But if you accept the responsibility, I believe... You should do it. Did you join any veteran organizations? I joined the American Legion, but I'm not a, the type to get involved. I also handled the, um, the monument in the town of Hamden. Uh, the mayor there was having quite a problem. Uh, they had, you had the, the, uh, the Vietnam War veterans, you had these veterans and those veterans, everybody wanted their thing. And he asked me if I would go there and help get it straightened out. And I just went in there and said, look, guys, I'm here to get this thing straightened out. You're going to get your monument. I don't know if you've ever seen it. It's pretty, pretty nice, the one in hand. And I said, but this is the way it's going to be. If you lived in Hamden, and you left Hamden to go into service. I don't care whether you live here now or now or not. Your name is going on that monument. And we're not going to give any special treatment to anybody. You're all, we're all equal. Whether you fought in the Civil War, uh, the Spanish-American War, whatever war. That's it. They're going on this plaque. If someone comes forward with a name, that's it. Now, any money that you have accumulated, I expect you to put it on the table and let's get the monument built. And that's it. I left them and it all turned out well. Uh, did you attend any reunions? Air Force is different than the rest of the service. You're in squadrons. You get ships. You can go anywhere one or two, three or four. Usually they don't ship the whole unit out. It just, it's like being in business, big business world. And uh, I've seen reunions for headquarters, USAF Air Police, one there. I was invited out to 
Um, I joined Air Force Security for a while. Out to the um, Air Force Museum in Dayton. And they were going to put a monument there. In fact, I used to fly with the Air Force to go to different bases to promote the Air Force with the political people. In other words, they put together a group of people. Uh, my job, I was very close to people like the Secretary of State and the Governor and that sort of thing. And in fact, uh, I met Mrs. O'Neill at the reunion, the 60th year reunion at uh, camp, which I hadn't seen her in a long time. And uh, I would get them to come on these flights and we'd go to SAC headquarters or uh, went down to Shaw Air Force Base, uh, just traveled all over the country at different air bases, probably once or twice a year. They'd send a KC-135 into Hartford and we'd get on. I'd have the commissioner of the state police or anyone that I could get that would help. Like if they wanted to have a new bomber and they were trying to promote that bomber, I would go and help them do that as a volunteer. And it was through a group called American Defense Preparedness. So I, that's my connection after. That lasted about two or three years. It was good, it was interesting. And I was happy to do it. How did this service affect your life? I think I made it better. I understand people a lot better. I understood people a lot better when I left. Uh, when you live at home, when you're young, uh, that's a nice little world. But when you get out there and see what the real world is like, and you have to be careful on who you pick on to be your friend. I'm sure you're experiencing that at school. Uh, it's different. And you walk away from the pains in the necks and you enjoy your people that you can do things with. That's what it taught me. I asked if, when I was shipped from one place or another, I'd lay on my bunk for days and kind of figure people out who I would like to be with and who I'd like to stay away from. <laughs> Uh, is there anything else that you'd like to add that we haven't covered? I don't think so. Um, I think you've got a pretty decent picture about where I've been and what I've done and what for and why and whatever. So. Okay. Uh, well, then I'd like to thank you for your service and thank you for taking the time to sit down with us. And thank you for uh, doing this. Thank you.